In today's episode, we come to Exodus chapter 8. God now sends three more plagues. Each one, like the first, involves something sacred to the Egyptians. God continues to demonstrate his power over the gods of the Egyptians, now involving frogs and lice and flies. These pests also inflict discomfort on the people of the land. Will the people's opinion of Pharaoh be swayed? Will the Pharaoh finally relent and let God's people go? Good morning. Today is Thursday, November 17th, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Thy Strong Word is sponsored by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Visit them at lhfmissions.org. Well, to help us explore chapter 8 and the account of plagues 2 through 4 is my guest this morning, the Reverend Curtis Dieterding, pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida. Pastor Dieterding, good morning and welcome back to the program. Good morning. It's good to be back and uh, it's good to to hear your voice again and and to be uh, part of the program and looking forward to it today. Yeah, you too. It has been a little while since we've been together, and since then, you guys have experienced a hurricane, Hurricane Ian, I believe. Yep. And so, you know, it was just a mess down there, and you've now you're no longer on the news cycle anymore, probably because of the election. But I'm interested, and I know the listeners would be too, with you down there at Fort Myers, Florida. How how have things been affected, and and how's God working to restore that community? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. That's a, that's a big question, actually. Um, the, it's still a mess down here. We uh, it's going to take a while before you know things get back to a spot where we can finally catch our breath again. Um, Zion is actually uh, the closest LCMS church to Fort Myers Beach in Sanibel, so. We uh, we were not impacted here on the church grounds the way that the communities south and and uh, west of here were because the the most devastating part of the storm even though the winds did tear up a lot of you know roofs and and trees and and lanai cages and so forth. Uh, the the worst part of the storm was the surge, was this water surge that came, because the the hurricane came directly at us, uh, and it was also high tide. Uh, that was that was a beautiful uh, formula and, and and a combination that actually just brought just an unbelievable amount of water inland, and uh, we're pretty far inland here. I mean, we're we're at least. Uh, seven to ten miles here inland, so that water really got pushed in here and uh, got into a lot of people's homes. And those are the people that really were the most devastated. Those and the ones that lost, you know, where their homes just floated away. I mean, there was just a lot of devastation down there at the beach and Sanibel, and uh, any any uh, homes that were up against the Gulf or the Estero Bay, which is just south of us here too. Wow. You know, I've been down there a couple of times. I've vacationed on Sanibel Island. And yeah, I've heard, and just depends on which news sources you get it from, things are just really nasty down there. And I I assume, though, the church is active, working to help people in the community, or at least your own members. How is that going? Oh, absolutely. So uh, about, about five years ago, when we were hit by um, Hurricane Irma, we actually had the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Disaster Response Team come and set up shop here on our campus. Now, we were actually having a lot of repair work done on our buildings at, at that time as well because we really uh, got hit hard by the wind and, and all the debris that was uh, that really did a lot of damage to the roofs of our, of our buildings. This time... Um, we have had no next to no damage. I mean, very little damage to the church. And uh, we invited the LCMS response team to come right back in here. And this is a great location because we're right in the middle of everything that happened. And I mean, it really hit right here. And so um, they've been here now uh, uh, since the storm and they've uh, they will be here into December. Uh, we'll have another group coming at the end of December. We'll have some college groups coming at the beginning of the year uh, when they're on spring break. And uh, there'll still be plenty of work to do even even after that's all said and done. So 
it's about a it's about a, at least a three to four month process as far as at least getting to a point where most people have been touched as far as getting help as far as the debris and so forth that's in their yards but um, as far as what's in their lives and what they're what they have to do now in order to just uh, uh, get caught up back, back financially. A lot of them go through a financial storm after this because, you know, the deductibles on hurricane in flood insurance is so high. Uh, it forces a lot of people to go somewhere else altogether. Wow. That is something else. Yeah. Well, today we're going to be talking about some plagues. I'm sure it probably feels like a plague <laughs> has landed upon you guys, but we know that the Lord is a, a gracious God full of mercy and steadfast love. So it's nice to hear that even though the news cycles have all but forgotten you guys, that the church is still on the ground, still helping their neighbor. And I'm, I'm so grateful and encouraged to hear that. Um, yeah, and I, and I want to say, you yeah. know, and I'm sorry for interrupting you, but I do want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to all of you out there who have uh, helped in some way. Everybody who's come down to volunteer, to those who have sent donations either to Synod or directly to us here. Um, this has been a very big help to the people here, and it's it's. It's been a joy to watch people's lives change uh, when they receive that kind of compassion, that kind of care uh, from our church. And it's not just our church. I mean, all the churches and all the groups that are down here working together. It's just it's it's a joy to see also all the blessing. It's not all you know, it's not all loss. Uh, there's a lot uh, of neighbors now helping each other. There's a lot of people. Um, that, you know, we've come together as a community. This is what happens generally whenever a catastrophe like this happens. And so it's it's been good to see the blessings, too, that have come out of all of this as well. That's great. And if you're out there and you're listening and you're thinking that I want to help in some way, probably the best way to get some information about that would be to call the uh, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod International Center. You can call them at 888-843-5267 and they will point you in the right direction. So, brother, uh, I'm looking forward to getting into this text today. I, I love dealing with the plagues, uh, not because they were pleasant, but because they demonstrate that our God is a God of authority. He's the one true God over and against the false gods of the people. And we think of them as these natural disasters, but they aren't. They are divine judgments. And in some ways, specifically on the gods of the Egyptians themselves, which is always fun to to hash out a little bit. But before we get into the text, uh, I think it'd be appropriate if you would start our time in prayer. Absolutely. Lord God, we don't know from day to day what uh, we'll be facing, but we know that we're facing each day with you. We know, too, that as we approach your word this day, that we hear the story once again of how you brought plagues upon Egypt. Uh, as you continued to work against the Pharaoh to show him that indeed you are Lord and God alone. We remember that as we hear your very word come to us and touch our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so we ask that you would continue to help us to grow in our love and understanding for your word and for you. And more importantly, your uh, unconditional love for us. Help us through all life's plagues and disasters to always hold fast in trust and in faith toward you that we might truly uh, give you thanks and praise for all the goodness that comes from your hand. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So before we read the text, uh, how would you like to set it up? You know, we know the first plague was the plague of turning the Nile into blood. Um, what, what else should we know as we head into this next part? Well, we should know that the, that the Pharaoh has this hard heart and uh, he's not about to uh, succumb to uh, a man who comes talking about his God. And uh, so even as each of these are demonstrated, I mean, he's even trying to justify how all of this is happening. Just like you said, you know. Uh, you know, some people say this is a coincidence. Well, this is an interesting series of coincidences that happen in order for this to uh, to all take place. So, um, yeah, we're working with a, a pharaoh who does not want to let God's people go. And at the same time, like you had mentioned just shortly uh, ago, you said 
um, it's a demonstration of just how powerful and how really awesome our God is. Uh, and he demonstrates it over and over and over again until finally we know that uh, he's going to uh, overcome uh, Pharaoh's uh, hard heart and uh, Pharaoh will eventually let his people go. As we mentioned yesterday, you know, there are three reasons that the plagues are given in Exodus by God. First is so that Israel might know, as the Lord would say, that I am Yahweh, God. Uh, and then that Egyptian would learn what that means, that he's the Lord. And then as a judgment on the gods of Egypt, which we will learn about a little bit more when we get to chapter 12. So we see here as the as the plagues come forth. He's sending Moses and Aaron up against a leader who God knows will not change his mind, at least not for a while. And he's also revealed that to Moses that these things won't really change his mind for a while. So it puts him in a unique position, but he continues to have faith in God's plan. And that's where we begin today. I'm going to read just the first seven verses of chapter eight. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. The frog shall come up on you and your people and on all your servants. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals and over the pools and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Now, that's about halfway through, brother, the, the text on the frogs. But we see here a couple of things, right? So he's going in his second plague. And just as before, the magicians are going to try to conjure up something that replicates it, which really shows us that this is a, a battle between the gods, except there's the one true God up against the false sorcerers and magicians of the Pharaoh. But yeah, so frogs, a very, very interesting plague that God comes up with. Yeah, I see that, um, you know, we look at this, this, uh, this magic that's being performed, these secret arts where the fro frogs appear. We know that we know today that magic is like sleight of hand, very deceptive. We know that the actual um, magic that appears to be magical is... Uh, is ex is explainable. There's a, there's always a, a way in which um, the magicians themselves and those who know magic and how it's actually performed and done uh, can uh, can truly know that uh, that's not you know that it's easy to deceive our eyes and to deceive our minds. And we see it all the time. Uh, there's there's all kinds of people on Facebook, you know, that, where they're showing these magicians that are on the street and they're just wowing and razzling and dazzling those those folks on the street. And they're they're thinking to themselves, well, I don't know how he does it, but uh, they I think everybody pretty much knows there is an explanation to magic. And so that's really what's kind of going on here, too. We know that whatever they were doing as magicians was not the same as what God was doing, who is the creator of all things. Yeah, and I always wonder if the Pharaoh knows too. I mean, the Pharaoh has a lot of inside knowledge. So even though his magicians, so to speak, are uh, copying this by, you know, basically sleight of hand, as you said, mm -hmm. uh, the Pharaoh, his only intention is to shut down Moses. So even if Pharaoh himself is not fooled, it still accomplishes the same thing. You know, look at me and my gods. We're uh, just as powerful or more powerful than your God. And I would say that it's not even though that Pharaoh doesn't believe in the Hebrew God because there's plenty of room on his pagan shelf for plenty of gods. But it's that, you know, he and his gods are the more powerful ones, because after all, if the God of the Hebrews was so powerful, then why are they slaves? <laughs> so that's sort of his thinking. And yet, you know, God has made it clear that I'm going to get glory over the gods of Egypt. 
And uh, so, yeah, he sends these frogs and what a, what an annoyance that there would be all these frogs, but we look back in history and because everybody's always trying to come up with some natural explanation for these miraculous events, um, they might point to the fact that there were a lot of frogs in the Nile and when the waters recede, it would be not uncommon for there to be thousands of little Nile frogs everywhere. And so those who are critical of the Bible might say, hey, this this is just a natural phenomenon that Moses is exaggerating. But we have what? The Pharaoh's reaction. He would know what the Nile frogs look like. He wouldn't have been concerned about that. Yeah, this time the frogs are this time the frogs seem to have a little different uh, reaction than what would be the norm, you know. Right. They're coming up into their houses, they're coming into their bedrooms, they're coming into your bed. You know, I know that a spooked frog in the bedroom is not a great thing to have. But <laughs> now, the, do you know this from personal experience is the I question. Do. I do that with, uh, <laughs> with the geckos that are all over the place down here. And, oh, sure. And with the, uh, with the tree frogs and the, and the, and the chameleon frogs. I mean, we got, we got those. You, you don't even see them till last minute. And before you know it, they're all over here. So I know what that feels like. And uh, these frogs are intentionally being brought into the homes of these people this is this is different and and this is different than just the frogs just being out there at the nile you know where they where they you would hope that they would stay and belong but these frogs are coming up and into the homes another thing too that people don't always you know put together is that when god yahweh is getting his glory over the gods of egypt everything that happens uh in these um, in these uh, uh plagues uh, uh can be connected to one of the gods of egypt and it's it's an interesting way to look at it and understand what might be going on so for instance as we talked about yesterday hapi is the is the guardian of the nile the spirit of the nile is uh you know the kanum is another god that's connected to the nile so they consider the nile sacred and same goes for these frogs sacred frogs you know frogs in ancient egypt were never intentionally killed they were considered holy essentially they are regarded as sort of incarnate representatives of the goddess Hecht, which was a goddess associated with fertility and childbirth. And so, yeah, you know, so if if you think that, well, I can't kill a god or I can't kill a frog because of their association with gods. And now there's this god of the Hebrews just producing millions of them and they're everywhere. And they're not just coming out of the Nile. They're coming out of the pools and everywhere else. Then, then, yeah, it's sort of humiliating your God, which is part of what God is doing. Right, right. That, and you, yeah, and you have two audiences here that are really paying attention to what's going on. You have the audience of the Egyptians and the Egyptian people, and all that that uh, that are under Pharaoh, and then you have the people of Israel um, who have been enslaved for many, many years, watching all of this take place. And we know that God is sending these plagues to frustrate the plans of Pharaoh to keep these people enslaved. And, uh, of course, uh, eventually we do see it actually does get to a point where it does work. Um, but God, it, 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 you're watching this, and God it appears like he's taking his time. But we look at it and see it as a demonstration of that he is still in control of all things in the universe, including that of creation and the creating frogs and, uh, and actually of all of uh, what God has created. And, and we see that in each of the plagues too. It's, uh, it's some creature, some animal, some insect that he has uh, created in this world uh, that, that, that brings this frustration uh, over a period of time upon Pharaoh. I mentioned in the introduction that perhaps the uh, support for Pharaoh is waning among the people. Now, Pharaoh, it, it's not as though he's up for election, right? So Pharaoh is a god king. They can't really do anything about him. But at the same time, even a god king, quote, uh, wants to keep his people pretty peaceful and he wants them to be easy to handle. Uh, do, do you think the people are getting pretty upset at this point? They, they probably weren't affected too much by the blood in the water. I mean, obviously, their water would have turned right. into it. But now it's getting a little worse. And, of course, you and I 
being students of the scriptures and, and having the historical hindsight, we know it's about to get a lot worse. Mm -hmm. But even right now, yeah, they have all of these frogs. I think I think the public opinion is about to sway. The polls are in and, mm -hmm. and they're not happy with the Pharaoh or at the very least not happy with the Hebrews. I'm not sure how they see it at this point. Yeah, and that's that's what I'm saying. It, it'd be interesting to know, you know, just where are both of those audiences, you know? Right. Um, you know, you, for Israel, it would be, oh, I guess that didn't change his mind. I guess that didn't change his mind. I guess that didn't change his mind. Then you've got the other group that's starting to get really annoyed and starting to wonder if their Pharaoh is truly who he says he is, you know, that he uh, is the, the God of, of, of his world and their world. And, and so, yes, it, this, this has already got to be started because this is annoying. This is absolutely annoying. And you know, that word gets out that this is all, um, this is all because of Moses as God. Yeah. Or, or because of Moses and, and Aaron and the Hebrews. So I would say that right. the, the people themselves, which we'll see, we will see in Exodus as they're finally freed, sorry, spoiler alert, but as they're <laughs> finally freed, um, they, the people, I, I, how can I say this? They themselves start to long for the days that were very familiar. They long for the the, the flesh pots of Egypt. They long for right. being back, back where they were, where they were comfortable. And so I think even the Hebrews um, are now getting some retaliation from the native Egyptians. And, you know, so it's uncomfortable for everybody. And so if you look at the the things that are going on in the present time and you look around and you think, well, yeah, God is trying to free us, and we know that we we have this promised land ahead of us. But right now, we have frogs, <laughs> and right. and right now we have people that hate us because of the frogs. And we're kind of sick of Moses at this point because before he came around, we were just sitting around the the the, the meat pots eating meats and vegetables. Uh, of course, they look back on it very romantically, and and uh, now things are different. And it really connects to us today, too. In the midst of bad things, in the midst of, of, of Hurricane Ian's, it's easy for us to get really frustrated and say, you know, God isn't here or whatever God's doing is worse than it would have been if God would have done nothing. Or why is God allowing this to happen? However you want to look at it. But then when you look back after, say, 20 years and you say, wow, that's why God was allowing these things to happen or why God was doing these things to happen. And so I think that's a situation here, too. The, the Hebrew people even are probably getting frustrated. They don't like the frogs as much as anybody else. They don't like the animosity that's being created between they and the Egyptians and their and their taskmasters, their slave drivers. And so they can't yet see what God has in store. But right. God's word is still there. He will bring them out, even if it kind of hurts in the process. That's a message for us today. Yeah. I think you hit. I think you hit the nail right on the head with all of what you just said, and and that's you know that's the direction that we're heading. We we see uh, we see a pharaoh that's becoming more and more frustrated, and we and and upset. We see a uh, we see a Moses who is being patient and continually um, bringing God's power to bear as God is uh, commanding him to do. Do you want to move into the next plague before the break? Sure. Let's let's go. Let's All right. Go, yeah. So I'm going to read verses 16 through 19, just a few verses. But we have our third plague. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth. And there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats in the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So if you have even your own magician saying, okay, we're <laughs> the gig is up. This one's real. Uh, something's going on. Uh, tell us about this plague of, of gnats or insects or whatever they are, lice, whatever they are. I, I find it rather humorous. You know, the magicians are going, okay, now gnats we can't do. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Uh, man, we we do get the gnats down here too. It's like, yeah, we get the frogs, we get the gnats. Uh, I don't know anything really more annoying uh, as you're trying to be outdoors than to have gnats around you constantly. I don't care if you run, if you walk, if you, no matter what you do. Once you are stationary again, all you see around your head is gnats. I mean, this is just absolutely, you know, over the top frustrating. And uh, it's interesting that even you can see a little bit of a change, even in the magicians uh, who were trying to do all they could to produce these gnats. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, and, and the magicians are now starting to go, hmm. This is the finger of God. You know, it's like there seems to be a change of heart starting to happen in this third plague that we haven't heard of up until this point. Well, and I think of it like this, too. I think they say, well, we can get our hand on some frogs. right? <laughs> but, we could do that. But where do you find thousands of gnats? I, yeah, they just give up. Yeah, well, they're billions of gnats. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. Now, they come in droves. <laughs> now you speak of gnats, so I'm also from the South. I'm from North Carolina, so I definitely oh, yeah. know about gnats. And <laughs> and growing up, I you know I think I remember asking my dad or my mom saying, you know, why did God make gnats? And I was taught, uh, and I still believe it to a certain extent. To be honest, I was taught that gnats were specifically made by God to uh to punish us for our sins <laughs> now it's not great lutheran theology i'll be honest it's a little bit more primitive baptist theology uh but i'll say as awful as gnats are uh that is true until until i gotta say brother i moved to minnesota and of i was course, gonna just tell you that minnesota <laughs> the gnats are as big they're, they're called mosquitoes there the mosquitoes so. yes it's the state bird so <laughs> right. Now, funny enough, we're talking about gnats, but the, the Bible here says insects. Uh, gnats are probably a pretty good, um, yeah, probably a pretty good guess of what they are or what kind of little flying. They're actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and I could be, but it, from what I understand, there are actually lots of different species of what we call a gnat anyway. There are big ones and little ones, and gnats sort of a, a category in our common language of all these little annoying flying insects. Uh, some mm -hmm. of the historical translations say lice. Uh, lice doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but regardless, because lice doesn't fly. I, I don't know. But the point is, um, regardless of what they specifically are, they're very annoying. And um, yeah, so it's just what is the judgment against the God, right? This. So here we go. Which God is being being having the glory uh, taken away from him by the one true God? And in this case, someone might say it is the earth god, Seth, because it involves the earth, the, the gnats or whatever they are, are being conjured out of the earth. And so now the earth god, Seth, is having judgment against him. And God is showing that, as you said earlier, not only is he in control of all creation, he's even in control of the gods of Egypt. And this one is Seth. Yeah, so, you know, I, I could just see down here too i mean i you know, i was thinking of something as small and as tiny as a gnat um they have these uh these bugs called no see -ums, and they call them that because you don't see them and we called those sand fleas when we were in the uh, uh the other side of florida and i remember uh those same bugs out in texas we called chiggers so those little if, if, if anything could have been annoying, it would have been those, but those would have also caused um, some discomfort for a long period of time, you know, yeah. for a long period. But the gnats, they come and they go, you know, once they're gone, they're gone. They're just annoying while they're there. So I, I, I'm looking at these plagues and I'm thinking, you know, God is using plagues that are just annoying. And I mean, just makes you uh, cringe. And the very first one, of course, didn't touch anybody unless you were actually in the Nile, you know, the, the one where he turns the water into blood. But well, uh, and I, what I hear you saying is they're survivable, right? Yeah, people they, they, people survivable. survive. It's yeah. just they, they drive you nuts. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's why I love that connotation, because you have the people constantly, literally just aggravated to the point where they're ready for regime change, perhaps. 
you have from those who are religious in Egypt's point of view, where their gods are being messed with. You have from the Jews point of view where, you know, here's God, um, you know, exercising his authority, but it's pretty inconvenient to them, too. So their faith is being put to the test. Oh, all kinds of wild stuff as we go through these plagues. Uh, right now, however, we are up against a break. So we're going to take just a few minutes, listen to these messages. And when we come back, my guest and I will continue talking about the uh, second, third and fourth plagues. The fourth plague is next. We'll see you on the other side. On America's college campuses, doors are open to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. The number of international students studying at American schools has more than quadrupled over the past decade. For many of these young men and women, it's their first time living in a free society where they can ask questions about Christianity. You can help answer their questions. Go to lhfmissions.org and partner with the Lutheran Heritage Foundation to translate good Lutheran books into languages these students can read and understand. lhfmissions.org Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me is the Reverend Curtis Dieterding, pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida. Now, folks, before we continue, I just want to say I love hearing from you. I say it every episode because it's true, and every email I receive, I answer. So send me your questions or comments to pastorboo at gmail.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R-B-O-O-E at gmail.com. Well, uh, Brother Pastor, you know, we, before the break, we were talking about the third plague, gnats, lice, sand fleas, chiggers or no seums, whatever you want to call them. There's this annoyance. It, it is uh, pestering. It, it diminishes the value of your life, but you can survive them. So the, the plagues um, are certainly God getting the attention of everybody involved. Um, anything else we want to say about those before we move into the fourth? Yeah, I just I just want to just reiterate what we talked about uh, before the break uh, also, which is there's something going on with the magicians of the Pharaoh, you know, that they are starting to identify that something more than magic is going on here. And we know that it's miracles. And so uh, I think it's good to note that as we continue into the fourth plague. Yeah, I definitely don't want to, you know, go over that too quickly. He says, they say, or one of them says, the finger, this is the finger of God. And that in of itself is an interesting way to phrase it. And to my head, it brings up something that has not happened yet, which is Exodus 31. And that is when God, you know, writes with his finger the Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone. Well, actually, he, he does that in 20, but he, he, we're told about his finger in Exodus 31, writing them into the tablets of stone, which is fascinating. And then, um, you know, I have some other cross references here, like Psalm 8 says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. Um, and then even in Luke, it says, But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you, Jesus says. So this finger of God, colloquialism for, you know, what we might say today, the hand of God at work. But they're saying the finger of God, just an an interesting visual. Right. And and I think what they're what they're and and no pun intended. Well, maybe so. Um, (laughs) What they're pointing at is the fact that uh, God is all powerful. And they're, they're looking at this as a very powerful uh, event that has taken place. And, 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 you know, he's just using a finger. <laughs> he's not even, you know, he That's hasn't right. really exerted himself as the, as the almighty that he is. And, I, I, you know, it just starts to make you wonder. They're starting to see that this God is real, that this God exists, that uh, this God uh, is way above magic and uh, has something to do with controlling the universe. And for what it's worth, you know, I want people to know that when they say this is the finger of God, you know, we use God, of course, as a way to refer to the one true God. Mm-hmm. Uh, the The Hebrew here would have been Elohim, which is uh, just 
really the generic word for God. And God actually is a generic term. Our God either is Yahweh. We talk about the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We can talk about the one true God in very specific ways. The magicians aren't necessarily completely converted over into being followers of Yahweh. So when they say this is the finger of God, they could as equ- they could easily be saying this is the finger of a God. But as uh, the pastor pointed out here, the point is not that they've suddenly been converted, but they who kind of know how to fool people into believing that their magic is real – they're the ones who are saying, no, wait a minute. We couldn't even figure out how to do this. This is God or a God or their God. However you look at it, they're starting to see for themselves that that the God of the Hebrews, he he's, he, he's the real deal. All right. So we're going to read chapter eight now, verses 20 through. Oh, let's do through 24 as we're introduced to the fourth plague. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall happen. And the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by swarms of flies." Wow. So God makes a distinction, a very visual distinction between his people and their people, which tells us two things. One, God is starting to narrow down for them in case they haven't noticed who the judgment is for. And two, it it reminds us that the the Egyptian, I'm sorry, the Hebrews up to this point, they've been enduring these plagues too. That's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it's very interesting indeed. You know, I was, I'm I'm thinking in terms of these uh, flies, I was trying to think in, in if I've ever been in a situation where there were swarms of flies. I've seen flies swarm, but never in a sense where there were so many flies I couldn't get away from them. Mm-hmm. You know, where there would be where the swarm would be that large. I've not I've not experienced that before. But I have experienced biting flies. Mm-hmm. Um, there just seems to be uh, times uh, of the year or maybe uh, maybe it's the, the, the weather in the air. I can't, you know, I've heard all kinds of things about why sometimes flies bite. I mean, I've had flies land on me, uh, you know, a few at a time maybe, but um, never had a swarm of flies. And I always thought, wow, if you had a swarm of flies and they bit you, um, how annoying would that be? And sometimes uh, flies can actually cause um, sickness in people uh, through bites. Yeah, flies are a pretty disgusting <laughs> kind of creature, even though they seem so harmless. And, you know, you have these biting flies. I, we, we had horse flies, you oh, know, down, yeah. down south. Deer uh, flies. Which, yeah. And so there's, this is another example of one of those times when this could involve any number of types of specific species. And, and the reason I keep mentioning that is because so often – People want to look back, critics of the Bible want to look back and try to identify exactly what the the insect was, exactly what a natural phenomenon could be. And when they do that, they often miss the point. In fact, the Hebrew here doesn't mention flies at all. It just says the word swarms. Mm -hmm. So flies is just an inference of, well, it has to be a swarm of something. And we're talking insects here, so it's swarms of flies as a generic term for, you know, any of these kinds of things. So, you know, yeah, they could very well be biting flies. And I actually assume they are because to look out and see just this, the, the, the sky is black with thick insects coming that are not only annoying, but biting and uh, this, as well as the livestock in the fifth plague that's destroyed in uh, tomorrow's episode, uh, we, we see here that God is getting his glory over uh, Egypt's foremost goddess, 
Hathor. Hathor or mm-hmm. Hathor mm-hmm. is represented by the cow, the livestock. And if you're an agrarian and agricultural society and you rely on your livestock, of course, they're going to end up being gods to you. They are gods to the Egyptians. And this is starting to affect them, too. So, yeah, so we also have Apis the bull and other things. But the point is, you know, God is continuing to associate his plagues with judgment over the gods of Egypt. But, yeah, these these flies. But now it's different, right? Because he sets apart the land of Goshen. That had to be noticed by the Egyptians, right? Right, right yeah. So now you, you live down in Laverne, Minnesota. Is that right? I live in the southwestern corner of Minnesota, which is, yeah, Laverne. We're about 30 minutes from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. There you go. Uh, yeah. So so I used to live up in Fergus Falls at one time uh, and, and serve Trinity Lutheran Church there, wonderful church. Uh, and the uh, the joy that I had there with my with my father who lived with us was to be able to just after a meeting at night or you know sometime when there wasn't a meeting or on my day off uh, he and I would just take uh, the little fishing boat that we had and attach it to the back of our minivan and and drop it into one of hundreds of lakes that were around us you know we would go to different places and fish just absolutely loved it. But one thing that I always remember about being out in that boat and fishing with my father is we needed to be off the lake before sunset because for some reason at sunset, there are swarms and I have seen these swarms of mosquitoes everywhere. In fact, you can't outrun them. (laughs) You, You take off in your boat to try and get off the lake after the sun has set and uh, you're going to get eaten alive. They they don't they don't care about the mosquito repellent or anything else. They come after you, and it, so we were really we really took care to to get off. So we know how absolutely not just annoying, but uh, how the after effects of those bites could be too uh, on making the trip on our way home and and so forth. Very very uncomfortable. Now, I, I can empathize with you, not because I live in Laverne. Now, actually, Laverne is, uh, you know, Minnesota is the land of 10,000 lakes. Right. Uh, Laverne in Rock County is the only county in which there are no natural lakes in Minnesota. Really? really? But <laughs> I did live for my very first call was in a little township called Corliss, Minnesota, mm-hmm. which is outside a town called Purim. Oh, yeah. In that case, it's about 30 minutes uh, east of Fargo. So a little bit north of Fergus Falls. So, and so, yeah, we had we had lakes and um, and little pine and big pine. And I bought a boat while I was up there and it was great. But you're absolutely right. I learned that <laughs> firsthand. And it's not just the immediacy of all the the swarms and the, the, the bugs and the mosquitoes. It's the welts they leave behind. Yeah, it's just it's just nasty, guys. And, and you know, <laughs> but again, it's survivable so far. God is, I think. And I don't know if you see this, too, but he seems to be ramping things up. Right. You know, blood in the Nile, and then frogs are nice, and then, oh, gnats are annoying, and then, uh, oh, you know, the, the flies, things are getting, things are getting uh, incrementally larger. Well, now our radio audience has discovered that we have fished on the same lakes up there in that area. So, <laughs> nice. so yes, yeah, so we know that we know what it's like, and uh, uh, probably can attach ourselves to the story a little bit more, too, but as a result of that, but. And it's something to remember, you know, I I spoke about how when I was a kid, you know, I was like, why are gnats? Why do they even exist? What good do they provide? Of course, we know ecologically they provide food for uh, for bats, I guess. (laughs) But anyway, (laughs) um, uh, the the point is, you know, and then the, the response was, well, it's it's God's punishment on us for our sin. Well, I don't know if I'd go that far. But it is something, dear listener, you know, whenever you next time you slap that mosquito or that fly or that gnat is bothering you, you know, think about the judgment that God rendered on the Egyptians and that this judgment wasn't because God is mean or that, you know, God in the Old Testament was just this angry person uh, or entity, I should say. But this is because God is doing what it takes to not only drive his people to repentance and the knowledge that they need salvation, but also to free them from eternal slavery. So there is a a discipline for his people and a judgment for those who are against him. In this day and age, we have to remember that God is our creator. We are creatures. 
And so we must submit even to his discipline when we don't like it and recognize judgment for what it is, something we want to avoid. That's why we're grateful for Christ. Um, anything else before we read the rest of the chapter? Because Pharaoh, he's kind of fed up too and decides maybe he will let them go out into the wilderness and worship God. So, I mean, this is this is touching the lives of the people very deeply. I mean, just as the very first plague, whenever they, when, when the water was churn, turned into blood, it killed all the fish and there was stench in the air and they couldn't drink the water. And so then you, uh, you move to this one and there's some similarities with the other plagues, like, uh, like with the, the plague of the frogs, all of a sudden now we have, uh, you don't, you don't hear it about the gnats, but uh, who knows the gnats probably made it into the houses too. But here we hear specifically saying, and that swarms of flies came into the house, at least of Pharaoh and his servants houses, that is, but you, you have, um, a place where you want to go, right? That that you find comfort and you can kick back and you can just uh, relax and just take it easy is is your house, and they don't have no place to go. I mean, if you don't if you don't have a house to go and do that in, where are you going to go? And and so uh, this is getting right into their the the, the meat of their life <laughs> of of their living in their home. So. I think that's pretty significant. And that, again, just as the fish were all killed there in the Nile uh, through the blood in the Nile, uh, throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by swarms of flies. Now the whole land on top of it has now uh, been destroyed uh, by these flies. And that's, to me, that's significant. The, the people have to be really um, starting to go, we got to do something here because this can't continue. You know, and we're yeah. losing everything now, and we're and we're frustrated and annoyed and angry. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. No, no escape. Really? Yeah, I, I, you you brought up your your home, and I I hadn't really thought of that before. To be honest. So we have this. You know, if if you your house is your your castle, mm -hmm. your your even if it's an apartment, you know, you're there. This is where you feel comfortable. You can relax. Uh, you can turn things off. They have no respite, even in their homes, nowhere to flee. If they were to run outside and try to get out in the wilderness, nope, sorry, everything is affected. Yeah, that's a mm -hmm. fascinating way to put it because it just shows you also how God is not limited in his power to just a location, right? Because gods of this time would have been considered gods of cities or gods of people or gods of, of you know, even uh, different types of weather phenomenon. Right. But the idea that there's this God who's in control of all of it and he's the only God would have been fairly unheard of. Mm -hmm. So he's demonstrating his power over all of that. Yeah, it's wild. So the people are frustrated, uh, but you know what? Pharaoh is too. Let's read the rest of the <laughs> chapter all the way through verse 32 from 25. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, go sacrifice to your God with the land. But Moses said, it would not be right to do so, for the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. Then Moses said, Behold, I am going out from you, and I will plead with the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh and from his servants and from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people, not one remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. Boy, Pharaoh is nothing if not consistent and predictable, but he doesn't let the people go. But uh, lots of good stuff in this text. Uh, take us through it. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, there's a lot going on here, just like you said. Um, you know, you, you can see that you're starting to, to get the, the idea that Pharaoh is finally had enough uh, he's finally softening up. This this plague of flies is just absolutely the end at this point. 
and uh, and and says, you know, Pharaoh calls Moses and Aaron and says that, you know, I want you to go and sacrifice to your God within the land. Um, and then Moses, you know, counters with that by saying that's that's that wouldn't be right to do that. It, you know, uh, the offerings that we sacrifice, Lord, our God would tick off your gods, you know, would tick off your the Egyptians because, um, you know, you, there's an acknowledgement is what was going to, is what's going to happen here. There's an acknowledgement that maybe their God is the true God, you know, have, have the Egyptians not gotten to that point after this plague yet. That, that kind of always surprises me too, but uh, this is what Moses is saying now. So he was just letting him know that they don't want to do something that's going to be an abominable to the Egyptians because uh, they know that usually the penalty is a vigilante group that's going to come and stone us. And so at least up to that point, um, it's interesting that Pharaoh was showing uh, some some softening by just saying, all right, if at least you know just go and sacrifice to your God within the land. And but he has a but he has a reason for them to do that, which we which we discover as we walk through this, right? Uh, we 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 realize that maybe if he lets them sacrifice to their God, that maybe they might actually take this plague away. Because <laughs> I'm sure that uh, he was very annoyed with this uh, as he was with the other plagues as well so yeah he, he definitely thinks he's going to benefit he thinks well all right i can get a respite from all of this if i just give in a little bit so either the pharaoh is thinking well i'm just going to lie and say yeah i'll let you go even though he knew he wouldn't uh because he knows that he'll get a respite from the event or Probably a little more likely, he's making a compromise. He says, okay, I know that you a long time ago, maybe four plagues ago, said that you wanted to go and worship Yahweh out in the desert. You want to go three days journey. And he's like, listen, how about you worship your God, take the plagues away, worship your God, but here in Egypt, but take the plagues away. So here we have in the in the weakest position – Pharaoh trying to negotiate with the one true God of the universe. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, you know, I tell you what, you know, you take away all the judgment against me and I'll kind of do what you say. And of course, God knows that he's going to, to not give in. Right. Um, Moses isn't dumb either, but Moses goes, he does just as he's asked. He pleads with Yahweh Yahweh certainly takes the things away, but because all it does is show to Moses and anybody else that's paying attention that Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He's not he's not going to let the people go. And if it weren't for all of these nine plagues, you know, we're only at four, but if it weren't for these nine plagues incrementally showing just the depths of Pharaoh's obstinance to the to the Lord, then the tenth would have seemed way overkill, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So so if we have these first nine, then we understand why the 10th come, even though God knew from the beginning that the 10th was the only thing that was going to do it. Right. But if that would have been the first, then people might have and could have said, well, look, the God of the Hebrews is just this evil, wicked God. But instead, he gives them nine chances to repent, uh, relent, release the people. And of course, he's not going to. Right, and you and you see, I mean, this is, you know, the last plague. You could see that there was now some weakening from the magicians, and uh, you know that there actually a couple of plagues before, and now it's moving over to um, Pharaoh. You know, the Pharaoh, and and of course, it's his heart that has to be changed in order for this this historical deliverance of God's people to take place because that is the focal point of this whole thing is that all of these things are happening uh, so that God's people would be freed and delivered from their enemies. And of course, we know that that story, this whole story, uh, this whole historical narrative actually attaches to the greater deliverance that occurs in Christ Jesus where we are freed from our major enemies, and not just someone piddly like Pharaoh, but the bigger spiritual enemies of, of our own sin, sinful flesh itself, 
and uh, of Satan, uh, of all the evil that this world can put put upon us, and even death itself. So we've got we've got us all. All of this is moving us forward to that that greater deliverance event. So you've got Pharaoh here, who is um, saying, you know what? I'll let you go sacrifice your God. It's not because he's a nice guy. It's because the motive is he wants something out of it. He wants an end to these flies. And so he allows them, and, and then don't go too far. <laughs> you know? And he allows right. them to go out. And sure enough, um, they they do the sacrifice. And, and Moses lays it out. It, you, you can't be saying that you're letting our people go and then you don't do it. You know, don't, don't be cheating again. And so, you know, this whole thing plays out. And Moses does go and pray uh, to the Lord. Um, on behalf of uh, Pharaoh, he does plead to the Lord. And uh, I think what I find really interesting before we get to that last part where he did cheat anyway, um, is the fact that when the Lord came to remove all of these flies the next day, he removed all of them. I mean, there wasn't a fly one to be found anywhere. And it's, that is a remarkable thing. Those three words, not one remained. I know. I, I, I know that there's all kinds of probably theological significance in terms of God cleansing us freely and completely. But I got to tell you, I also see it as Pharaoh, once he sees that this has happened and he knows, in theory, he's on the hook for keeping his promise, I bet he scoured the palace looking for a fly <laughs> so that he could say, Oh, look, your God couldn't remove all of them. Here's oh one, you know, <laughs> dead in the windowsill. Uh, <laughs> I honestly but, didn't even think that way. <laughs> that, that's well, that's just how my mind worked. <laughs> but I, I'm sure he's looking for it out, <laughs> but he, but, but it is beautiful though. Right. Not one remain. When you talk about even God's judgment against the Egyptians and when he relents, he relents completely. And in uh, it, and I think this is what you were alluding to, you know, for us through Christ, not one single tiny little judgment remains, not even a bit. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, brother, we are at the end of our time together, but it's been very enjoyable. Is there anything else you want to, you know, make sure that the people know before we end today? Uh, yeah, I just you know looking at these this story, and I was I was already alluding to that uh, the fact that you know all of what we're into right now in this in these in this story of uh, really moving toward the Exodus, uh, which this uh, this whole story is in that book of the Bible, uh, is pointing us to that that greater deliverance story, which is our deliverance, you know, the deliverance that we have because of what Christ has done, and blood was shed for that. Uh, death, a death was died. I mean, a death was died. Christ died a death for us that actually was one final sacrificial death that uh, would free us from all the torments of this world and all the plagues and all the hurricanes and all the things that can come upon us that are storms in our life. And uh, he wants us to fully trust in him just as he wanted his people back in the day with Moses to trust in him as well. Amen, brother. Well said. Well, I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Curtis Dieterding, pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida. Hey, pastor, thank you so much for being on the show. It is always a joy. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. And folks, thank you for sticking with us as we go through Exodus, which, um, as the pastor said, is our story too. Tomorrow, we'll head into chapter nine and we'll hear about God's judgment through three more plagues. Until then. May God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray. Father, keep us in thy strong word. <laughs>